computing, linked data, obviously. He's contributing to uh, various uh, workshop uh, organizations and uh, committees, uh, also conferences, of course. He's a co-editor of the uh, famous uh, semantic sensor network uh, ontology, uh, which has been standardized. Basically, my background is from semantic and uh, database. So, if you are in AI and other fields, so some of things in here uh, might give you the other side coming to the AI. So, I, I would try with if the clicker is working. It doesn't seem to work. of abstraction and reason uh, from the data and then we automate the process and in this thing together so let's see if that is normal AI architecture that uh, AI enabling architectures you have to do a lot of things to getting from okay let me try to use the mouse. So you want to get from sensor into your mission or your application here. Uh, so you have to do from structured data, unstructured data here. Uh, go to data labeling or managing anything up to the algorithms and then do some other intelligent thing until you get to the application. Of course, doing that you have to do with hardware, other things, not to mention 
several factors. So there's a lot of factors. They see the good survey that they list really a lot of technology that nowadays you have to check uh, into the concern and, and building such a thing. So one thing in this uh, lectures, want to see the challenge whether you go from the left to the right, just one line of code or one query. So it will the technology will give you that uh, capability that you don't have to go through all this daunting step to get to the end. So before doing that, we're going back, seeing the sensors, what sensor can give you uh, in terms of data. So the early day, I think this the problem with uh, resolution. So this is uh, the sample videos in early day, what Google start doing, Google self-driving car. And you see now they a lot of example when you do machine learning, they will start with that. But you see the car generate a lot of sensor. They have to perceive the environment to go from the like, video stream into something a bit abstract, like bounding box, 3D, 2D, obstacle on the road. So I think a lot of you doing here, doing convolution net and this thing to get the other end. But you see the stream of data is not from the, you can get from sensor, the row side unit can give you, in ITS system, other car can give you. So the sensor will give you a lot of stream data coming to you, but how to fit to the AI uh, is another thing. So it comes to whether you deploy the sensor they, they are. Is it easy to connect to AI and get the other end that you see the abstraction, uh, perception that you need to build a cool application. So it turned out the people, oh, the resolute. So the, the people from Internet of Things from the beginning, uh, they going to say, what is the most successful uh, information infrastructure there is the web. So the web was successful because it was have a different source. They had a standard format like HTML where they annotate information. And whether the 10 years ago and 15 years ago, people start saying, okay, let's uh, have a unified uh, information model for exchange uh, between the web for the search engine to collect information from the web. So they come with one simple thing is, uh, one unified data model called RDF, when you can present mostly everything for the search engine to read your website. So it had a billion website out there. For some Google Knowledge Graph is one of the sample they collect the data. So that, in that sense, the web of things coming out of that. Let's see how to abstract this thing to make it sim simple for the data consumer and producer to generate the data in here. The things that carry out sensors and have protocol and all several things to make it really difficult to consume data from them. So what they have here, let me see. There's thing that everything in the things like interaction, affordance, data schema, security, configuration that you can expose in one document to describe them. If the format is, uh, if you see the icon here, that is the, basically is RDF in the early day is the, uh, the, uh, the icon they pre represent for RDF triples. So everything that you can put in the document like this, and then you can expose to the other one. Uh, uh, its power is, is with the RDF, you can express mostly the data schema in every intersection. Uh, and the um, interaction inside the things into the document or several documents that can interlink together. You can expose to exchange two guys from consumer um, to producer or you can exchange via interme uh, intermediate uh, partner. Uh, this is the process that was done and then released it, the, the standardized um, um, architectures and also the, uh, the data schema here. So they give really simple way for you to describe a thing that carry information and other step for you to bootstrapping, uh, to connect to the device and how to interact with them. Uh, and uh, the, the other part is 
uh, the data that can be exposed to them is you have the data schema where you can see what you have and you can provide the other to collect for you. So, and of course, yeah, you will have the data schema where you can describe some information what you have uh, inside the data when you contact the other side to provide the data to them. Um, this, this is one of the figures that to see that how you, the model in the document that you have uh, graphical, graph, a graphical presentation is basically the document can see at the graph, so that's why you somehow associate with knowledge graph and other information because RDF can present at the graph. In here, you have the model at the switch in here can present that it's the squid and have the status and you can squid uh, the, have some actuation with them and set some status you can see whether it's overheating the other uh, stuff as well. So, but that just the first level of semantic for you to, 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 to add information on the meaning of the information uh, model is it uh, still one step away for you to have the anchoring semantic where you can note in the context to a data, the meaning at the human that perceive in the world. So the, the beauty of RDF or the serialization uh, format like JSON LD allow you somehow uh, put a notation on the meaning on the syntax in here. For example, here you define how you input to the table matter and you uh, specify they see the expected ambient temperature and they hear the taxonomy of the, the meaning of the thing is the expected ambient temperature is actually a temperature and you have the whole hierarchy of the meaning uh, of the specification. It's the way that you put in the specification to tell application what you mean by that. Uh, uh, when the other part of reading uh, the specification uh, of, of the things. Um, the, this work, okay, this another figure couldn't show up, okay. So this work, um, okay, I couldn't show the first one, let me, okay, somehow it's work like that. So. The work that come out today on the term the semantic uh, and um, in semantic interoperability um, for information model go from academia um, to adoption and standardization that you can see several things now you can look it up. Um, so you have the, the ontology for you to describe semantic sensor networks, all things about sensor that observe the world. You have things to describe uh, the web, uh, the, uh, the thing to connect to the web. So you have a lot of companies like Siemen or Intel or Oracle already involved. So it's in production now. And you have other things relevant to connection like 1M, 2M, SC, talk about how you put the semantic ontology for network connection. So it's already happening. But currently so far would just to give some just first step semantic into the networking protocol, the interaction pattern, and something where you can put more meaning. Uh, the question is, how is can have one step further into the AI feature that you want? Is how the semantic or a notation on the step you put in the configuration will connect to your AI component later. So. If you see that most of the data will get from sensors, and naturally to see this, you can see the sensor fusion will come into place, and now we see how the semantic will go into statistical inference and logical reasoning in the next. So the other uh, complementary part of it, um, the semantic for Internet of Things, is actually it came before the thing description. It, uh, the thing that we work like I think more than 10 years ago when we think that to add the meaning for any sensing data coming in is the ontology for uh, adding semantic for sensor and observation. So 
the way that we do modeling the sensor and uh, the observation process is come down into um, how to make the, the, the information model simple. So what you see in here is only three type, uh, uh, five type of information you have to model is the, the way to say that you had the sensor that help you to observe the world. The, the world it can have the feature that you interest and with some property, for example, uh, I, I want to observe the temperature of the room. The room is the object you want to observe and you deploy the, the sensor there. And then whenever the sensor do one calibration in, 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 uh, uh, of the sensor device and get the information in, we call the observation. And this really simple model for you to know pretty much all information you can get from the sensors and give the meaning of that. So this one is sample from our spec uh, document. As, as look really hairy here. But in the core you see the black box is the concept, the core concept for you to capture the information. The other part we call instantiation, that uh, one observation concept can uh, help you to instantiate as many reading you have and you put that uh, value into the property of the, the, the ontology class. Uh, the, the, this sample give, give you how the information is actually interlinked together to make it really complicated relationship you call, we call semantic relationship that normal information modeling practice you do with relational will not work. And this is the way that we people are doing with the a uh, new technology called graph database or knowledge graph for managing uh, new type information from IoT and sensor now. So talking to create that complicated knowledge graph basically is quite simple. It's, it's pretty much these five patterns. The first pattern that I give you a sample here and the, the rest you can figure out when you see the slide. So in RDF, where is every annotation is like you write the English sentence with a combination with single sentence and conjunction and these things. So uh, in here we um, modeling uh, an observation. So in here I see this the data entry is an observation and which has a kitchen at the feature of interest. So you observe the kitchen and you observe electric consumption, and then we, you use the sensors, this is the end sensor device, and this is the meaning. The simple pattern is like you add a lot of information by create a simple part, the like a simple um, structure English sentence, and you combine them uh, by the more complicated sentence to describe uh, the meaning of everything coming out of the sensors. Uh, the, I recommend if you work on the semantic sensor or you interested to that, we have really good document. We have two paper out that that's a lot of that, uh, pattern that people just follow a sample and then you can figure out how you model the sensor in your use case. In this, I will go down some example with autonomous vehicle with uh, that, but you have other use case, uh, use case I recommend that you look it into uh, the document. Okay this ugly. So what the value you get from semantic annotation is you can use to type a query similar to SQL uh, or you uh, call Sparkle and maybe another graph query, uh, query language called GraphQL. So uh, any of you know GraphQL? Okay, quite a few. Uh, Sparkle? Okay, so I have been this Sparkle, you, we have more people. So, but it's kind of, you have the data that I showed before that look like the graphs, and you have the query the structure uh, following the graph structure and you can query. Uh, one thing is it hidden in here uh, with the semantic, you can query the data without having to exactly match. For example, you want to query tem temperatures uh, and that associate with char um, the, the, the action, you can change uh, the property of that. So they will matching 
all the subclass of that. In, the, in this example, you use uh, the, the IoT schemas. So you only have to go for the abstract class that matching you, and the rest will be matching by the, the meaning um, subtype, uh, that are subtype here. Uh, so this the, are the whole semantic web and graph data stack th there with the logic. The reasoner will help you to do the magic. Uh, it's, it's a lot of new system like uh, um, technology from Oracle or Amazon which can have the enterprise version of supporting this logic reasoning in their graph database. Uh, the interesting with the Sparkle and GraphQL is the REST Bay, where you can build interesting application like we was, some years ago we was able to uh, build the matchup around 200,000 source of sensor that have several data format, have a, a different type data source. We get from the camera, we get from uh, fly information, we get the weather, uh, in here several type. And we just get the source, we do some few annotation in the end, the whole semantic web track can give us uh, all the tools that we only have to use HTML and JavaScript and to build a portal that, uh, uh, that can, can, can can uh, show all the visual information of, of this amount of sensors. So that part we have you to do the integration uh, really fast. Uh, but uh, this is normally you work with uh, the data in the same modality. It is the, the other step. What can you do with this uh, uh, kind of uh, data? Uh, pipeline. For example, going to autonomous vehicle, that this is a sample that um, uh, Mercedes S-Class S500 have in terms of sensors. So you have uh, short range radar system, you have long range radar system, you have camera, you have stereo camera. They have different uh, um, um, features. They have you, uh, they can deploy different part of the car, but they have different view. Um, a few of you for getting information for you to do uh, object detection and whatever to have the car drive. And you see that even one simple platform like take, you have different type of sensor, give you different modality of sensing information. Um, is it uh, people build that when people build this kind of processing pipeline, they had to build specific algorithm, uh, AI machine learning for uh, certain size sensor and they fuse it in, in sensor fusion to be able uh, to build this type of pipeline. If you look down in this pipeline, you will see that the sensors kind of like attracted in what you have in the end is just lane and drivability map is where you see the obstacle and then you fit in the motion planner is the core here, right? In here, it doesn't matter. Some people use LiDAR, several cameras. Some people say, like Tesla now coming out, say that LiDAR is too expensive, will be obsolete. But people in LiDAR so will argue the different. But uh, when it matters is here. How you do a better motion planner by building the drivability map here. So how the drivability map that need to be built so the one example from autonomous system is seen 2014, but I think it's still uh, valid today for any autonomous system. So the car perceived was environment, and they build actually the map to see where they can drive, what the obstacle is, and to build the motion planning um, component. So they continuously update their map by sensing what's around. And you see every time uh, step here, they have recomputing what they're getting at the, them at the stream. So you see that mm, the car or the drone, they are the, uh, they, they do in the same model, getting s sensor data from the stream inside the car or whatever it is to build this kind of map. So in the semantic, uh, perspective or link data, we see that how we describe this information back into 
RDF or link data model. Uh, so we are doing that uh, in, in some of, of the project, project we are doing now uh, with robotic and connected to high cost. And you will see, oh, okay, it's hard to see. So the idea is we model the ontology part in here you see down there. So you have two parts to model what's in the car. So you have autonomous car, you have front data, data uh, radar, ca camera sensor. You link with the other met metadata of what's in the car and you have the other video frame and you have other detection. You see that object and other thing, you can see another example. So you want to present everything in the graph model of the information where uh, this thing can present in uh, semantic web um, kind of way. So this one example that you do uh, convolution net quite familiar with object detection. So how, ma how, ma how many of you are familiar with co uh, co convolution net? I expected more. But, uh, so, so if you do object detection, basically you get every video frame from camera to to detect traffic side, truck, whatever class. Uh, how many of you actually, where they get the class name from? When, when they do that, when they, why they decide this class name is matching that when they do data labeling process. So I will show you. So, most of the, uh, the project that come from the early day is uh, you get all the video frame, uh, draw the bounding box here, and then assign label. So how to choose the label it depend on the data set. So the early day, the email net, they use WordNet, uh, CocoNet, they do similar thing, but in the end they say too many label, and we decide from the people doing labeling, we vote for, uh, the 60 class because people couldn't distinguish more. So it's really tying down the human perception on labeling the nouns to the class. So we will go down that how the mainnet relevant to WordNet uh, later. So this is another figure that doesn't work out. Um, so if you see that in here, every Video snapshot we call an observation in Scylla video frame. You see that in the video frame, the traffic light was recognized, the truck, uh, one truck, two car recognized the frame. In the graph way, every frame we see one snapshot that connecting to core metadata, grounded into we call common sense knowledge base that mean WordNet, concept net, and some other thing that relevant to human perception in natural language way. Uh, that happened now most of late data labeling process to do most of the deep learning architecture that you see now, uh, whether you do um, um, object detection or visual um, query answering or a bit more, you always tie out the, uh, to label what is in the pictures on in your data with the label. Normal label will go back into the human uh, kind of understanding what it is. So basically, the learning is mimic the process of how people understand or perceive the world from showing their the image. So in here, what I did I mean by worm, uh, email net and word net? So in the early days to create this, the first, a few first computer vision model, I think this is the most successful one is the email net. Um, so they get a category from WordNet, which is basically they build some kind of common sense knowledge graph uh, from English dictionary. And then they will see how things will be categorized in terms of similarity uh, um, and uh, uh, hierarchy of the meaning of this. And did you see the, how they categorize a mammal uh, up to the dog and husky there. So they classify the image and say, show to the people, what do you think? And they say, I will label the, this thing. And in the end, they took to the convolution net to classify the image, what you see. Uh, the other thing that 
interesting that they even sh show the uh, the the the, mm, the in the labeling that to show you the somehow the component that create the object. This is how we see the world. Is the car wheel will be composed by these kind of things. So what the trend trend in AI now that merging symbolic AI and uh, deep learning is they see that the, from the natural language as a prior when you understand the world with nouns and verb and relationship, uh, they extend the word net into by look into Wikipedia, uh, look in, in Wiki today, how people talking about the world is a statement in English sentence there. And then if you see the simple, what it doesn't mean by car, and then you see a lot of related terms, car can drive, it's a big vehicle, it can cross, uh, they can uh, location uh, where you can find the car, what is the part of the car, all this relationship we call a semantic relationship or somehow you can call common sense knowledge that how the hu human perceive the world and understand uh, by constructing the meaning uh, of the things. So it, it, it will, it's, uh, it's, it's the, the structure of the meaning a human can take to the computer uh, or AI to understand the world or perceive the world uh, based on this structure of semantic relationship. So people talk a lot about deep learning. I think it's really great technology have been done over the years, especially in pattern recognition and computer vision. But they saw a lot of limitation now. It's pretty much based on the learn, learning data you can get. And this would generalize in other situation in the world will give you the better model. If you don't have, you have crappy data, you, there's no way to get a better learning model uh, out of that. So that's why we come up to the thing that in AI that relevant to semantic part of IoT, and also uh, it, uh, I don't think it's a new trend because the logic, reasoning, and chaos in there um, together with deep learning for, for, for quite some time, but it's worth fading out when the deep learning thing coming up. But now it's taking back in last few years, if you're looking big venue like triple AI, ICAR is the top venue of AI. There's a lot of work now to I combine with logic reasoning with deep learning. That means you can combine with human knowledge in, in a common sense way. Uh, you understand the physics, you understand of the rule, um, in the abstract and uh, logic way, and you combine with deep learning. This is one example that is one of the new paper of this year. So I referenced that we're working similar thing, but we couldn't get more better illustration than I think I, I better promoting the work. I like this work a lot. Uh, so you see here, this is a way that encode some semantic rule, or uh, in here, in the paper, if you read it, it's called ASP, but uh, it's another form of symbolic value you can get to encode the world. The, the one situation, if you do computer vision, is really hard for the computer vision or deep learning uh, architecture to learn when a tracking was occluded by a, other object. But with human, if even the car was covered by other, you will see the car will be appear again. How we encode that? So in the symbolic uh, logic reasoning, you can encode that, say, it will be covered around three seconds, and based on that, velocity of the, 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 the vehicle, it will reappear again. So this work, I think this comes the second best in this year, eight cars uh, paper, because they com combine that kind of logic into, um, um, the reasoning process that they can improve the current deep learning model that can do in tracking uh, that mostly used in autonomous vehicle. So, and then this all this assumption is really interesting part is they can combine the deep learning is to give you some uncertainty about your pattern matching because there's no way you get 100%, you get 90 something. And then we create different, they call hypothesis in logic way, and you say that 
if the car will be disappear behind that car, it 80% you will see the reappear again and you put in that at hypothesis. And then the logic reasoning perspective that find the best explainable model and then we're coming out to combine these things together uh, that will get you the better uh, AI. Um, I think it's a bigger component that combined both were. So this coming back to the architecture, you, you see that in 2014 or so for the car, it's now the coming back nearly the first slide I show you. It's about you perceive, but what you perceive even human, you look in the eye, you not always 100% uh, certain of what you see. And then you s use some deduction logic to say, okay, I'm quite certain this guy. You can see the face, you can recognize the people, you don't need to see the whole body. Or you see, see a license plate, you know that's the car that you know, or the model and the other features. So this is the whole, whole um, uh, interesting uh, architecture now that you have some part of deep learning here. So you see, you have the part of deep learning, you have logic reasoning combined together and you combine to the hybrid part and then you can improve. Uh, the interesting part, uh, come back to the first question, can we can do it simpler in terms of AI car architecture, a few line of code or one line of code or one query? is the semantic part now. Uh, so can we hide it, all these components when we call, uh, you have the deep learning part, you have logic reasoning part, you have hybrid reasoning part, uh, can we make it simpler? So I don't have to handle the, all these things. So one other thing that come out of this from our group, and I think the our group, uh, two other group in uh, Microsoft and MIT, doing the kind of abstraction in database point of view. Just uh, I have early warning from the database backgrounds. We see everything as a query and simplify by compiler to hide all the component AI and whatever it is. Give them the simplest interface and one query and all this component will be compiled and as skill and get you the other part. So this is one of the trend that they hide all these things behind the database or the system that you post, we call a declarative queries look like English statement like, give me all recognized moving object from vision sensor mount in front of the car. And I don't care what kind of sensor you have, whether you LiDAR, radar, short rain, and whatever it is, whether it's type vision sensors, it's good for me, abstract enough. And then I need to detect the moving object because the moving object is dangerous uh, things moving toward me. And this, all the logic and statistical inference component we kick it in doing whether I use uh, faster RCNN, Zolo, and whatever, which get a good quality with the type of sensor and give me the result and come back, give me the drivability map for that the car can navigate the road. So that, the final message for you from my understanding how the semantic was go from internet of things, give you the sensor combined with the AI, and I think in the abstraction, all the big company were going down the way that come back to the simple interface for you to give a one kind of declarative query, you can write one statement and pretty much we automatically compile all the AI component down the road uh, in next few years uh, uh, for that. Mm. So that's it for my presentation. <laughs> Any questions? I was invited to give uh, the overview how the semantic things. So.
So uh, I come from deep learning, machine learning background as well. So uh, uh, nowadays I'm taking a lot of interest in autonomous uh, driving and all this stuff. So I was really uh, keen to know a little bit more about SQLs, the uh, same slide yeah. which we are yeah. in. It's my yeah. workshop. Yeah. So that's why I try to promote in hidden way. So. <laughs> yeah, so like how is it uh, actually put in real life and uh, how, it's, how is it put to practice? So, that's so um, I, I as were my PhD thesis, then from the beginning we similar abstraction that we had a lot of sensing. We want to collect the data from these things. So industry coming, we don't want to write a, a lot of code. We don't have to, want to reconfigure the code in the, uh, in the IoT device. So actually one of the part of the SQL was licensed for IoT gateway. The simpler every node just install the SQL is the, like the database at the middleware. You just deploy one query like this on the network like get me all the temperatures and they will coordinate uh, with them. Of course, you have some middleware and communication, but the, commu uh, the data exchange is in RDF format, so you don't have to worry much. These things have some abstraction, and they don't reconfigure the, how the data routing is a bit magic. Now we're moving a bit autonomous vehicles, the same philosophy where the car can read the data from the roadside unit and other by deploying, by broadcasting. I need sensor data within one kilometer. And you put a window, so the, the data should be one or two second delay or something. And I need about uh, this obstacle or the car moving toward me at the semantic. Mm -hmm. And then they do all discovery the, the route, and they get all the uh, computer vision, deep learning running, okay. where the guy run mobile net, efficient net, and not nest, or you have power, you can run faster as CNN. You just check like long time to run one that thing. So uh, that's the idea that abstracting the software the, uh, to toward the, um, the really big stack of the deep learning part and data integration part. And that uh, one of the things we find interesting is when we looked at all the deep learning, labeling process, we come back to the people uh, understanding natural language uh, way and nouns and verb and this thing. And in a semantic web way is we had a way to formalize it and put it all together. And people just write in the really normal language queries, and then the system can figure out themselves. Uh, so we prepare one or two papers in ICHI and WWF next year, doing this, this, this kind of thing that uh, deep learning going to with the statistical in inference on that. Okay. The next version, we see that SQL, ML is blah, blah, blah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's related to uh, query languages, and um, I use a lot of Spark SparkQL language, mm. and I was wondering if you can uh, say which are the advantages or disadvantages of using SparkQL over GraphQL language. Uh, I think it's hard to... Somehow I come from Sparkle QL perspective, but I, I think GraphQL is more intuitive if you're familiar with JSON data structure. It's a kind of, when you start that, you get momentum and you're used to with that. It's really fast to debug and this thing. But with me, it's not different from the, the way. It just a matter you use JavaScript or you use PHP. When you're familiar with it, it will be faster for you. Okay, so yeah. They have the same as expressivity. They, you can express the same things. The core thing that you can do similar thing. I okay. think they have some other advantage. For instance, GraphQL, you have some other nest structure that Sparkle yeah. couldn't do, I guess. But now, I think uh, several months ago in Berlin, uh, we W3C and uh, come to uh, bring together all the Graph database people and uh, Sparkle QL people come rough to. Uh, to define something that unify on that. Nice so you, you see, you had a graph, you want to query in the graph way. That's, nice. that's the, the way how the data will, will be going now. I don't know which, which one will win. Maybe two of them will exist at the same time. Let's see. <laughs> Thank you. 
so I wanted to know if the semantic uh, the, uh, the semantic AI is a, a process which comes before uh, uh, together with data pre-processing in AI. Uh, as in uh, the data that will be fed to the networks, neural mm. networks, that data has to be pre-processed. So this mm. semantic AI is a technique to pre-process the data? I think in this uh, presentation, I meant the semantic in renewable general way. It's not the semantic people, semantic formalized. Uh, because natural language uh, way you have talk about semantic in, in, in really I think uh, vaguer way how people perceive because in language expression you have some uncertainty. Other people in KI do the semantic like you have to certain every statement you say. But in here you say so when you say this thing you might be meaning different, but they have a, a small window. So uh, uh, the early semantic also came with that, but they have a long way people KR doing formula, formula logic to make things, everything have to be true all the time. But now it's going to way now, it can be some uncertainty there, uh, especially to deal with learning. There's no way to be certain. Okay. All right, then let's thank Dan again for the great talk. Okay, so now let's, let's make 10 minutes break and then we'll continue.